Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome to our fifth global lecture this academic year. And the second lecture in that series, uh, which will feature one of our new faculty members. And we are very proud to have all our new faculty that were hired in September of last year. And we are even more happy that some of them have begun to take an opportunity to participate in, in this lecture series. Um, if you were reading uh, the Time magazine last week, uh, was reported, was probably reported elsewhere too, um, that in Washington, D.C., I know we're going to talk about New York City today, but another major city that I will uh, mean, Washington, D.C., the uh, uh, rate, the HIV AIDS infection rate in Washington, D.C. is now at 3% of the population, which is uh, the highest in the nation. And um, even more stunning is the increase uh, between the years 2006 to 2007, which is actually at 22%. Uh, and even that number does not yet tell the full story. Um, the full story will become even more um, apparent when you take into consideration that uh, informed estimates are that about one half, uh, one third to one half of those that are infected are not aware of their infection. Uh, we should also know that usually 1%, not 3%, 1% is the benchmark when a health issue is defined as a generalized and severe epidemic. 1%, not 3%, 1 And so it becomes immediately aware here that you have a context where it is continues to be very important uh, to study um, the public education of um, issues surrounding HIV, um, AIDS in major cities, but I suppose also in rural areas as well. Um, it's, it's a very important topic. It remains on the agenda, uh, in fact, I'm, I'm not sure how much was spent nationally in the past, let's say, eight years um, on uh, public education on these issues, uh, but it remains on the agenda. It should probably be increased. Um, and so you see how important the research becomes that Professor Groskopf is doing and speaking to you now. Um, I would just like to point out that for the first time we're also recording uh, our lectures. Um, so if possible, um, there should be no walking across the uh, camera or immediately in front of the camera if you can prevent it. Um, we hope to put these things on uh, certainly the college website and perhaps even on the CUNY uh, website as well. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to invite um, Professor um, Mitchell Brodsky, who is the Deputy Chair in Professor Dorfkopf's department, um, to introduce uh, the speaker of this lecture series today. Thank you. comments about HIV and AIDS. As most of you know, this is still a very a devastating disease. Uh, our population is still at risk of contracting HIV. Just because it has not been in the news every day doesn't mean that it's any less important or 
or severe. It's, it's a devastating disease for not only the people who contract it, but their friends and family members, for the entire community. Now, as we know, there are certain risk factors when studying any disease, and some of the risk factors for HIV AIDS, as we know, is primarily unprotected sex, one of them. And many of us sit here today and think, yeah, unprotected sex, well, yeah, that's one. But studies have shown that even though people have said that they engage in protected sex in their life, that almost 90% of people say that they can recall at least one time where they engaged in unprotected sex. And so for anyone sitting here or who have participated in those studies, perhaps it's only lucky that more people have not come down with this devastating disease. Of course, sharing needles or syringes is a large risk factor. Having certain medical conditions, such as sexually contracted diseases of syphilis, genital herpes, chlamydia, and gonorrhea. Also, being a healthcare worker, someone who is around contaminated blood and needles are at risk. With 2010 in the horizon and new technologies being introduced every day, it is now time to study whether any of these new technologies are impacting the rate in which uh, HIV and AIDS is being transmitted. Some of the questions that we might have are, when we're looking at risk factors, are people more likely to contract HIV if they meet in after hours clubs, if they meet in schools, or if they meet through you know, social networking websites. If there are correlations, then the sooner we know about it, the better, and then something can be done about it. The more we know about the behaviors that contribute to the, to the uh, contraction of, of this disease, the better chance we'll have to reduce or eventually eliminate this transmission to specific populations within our community. We are fortunate to have such a researcher in our midst here at York, and that is Dr. Nicholas Groskopf. Some of Dr. Groskopf's research interests is, is in HIV, prevention and education of lesbian, gay, and bisexual transgender health perspectives. He has earned his master's degree at New York University in the field of human sexuality, marriage, and family life education, and his doctoral degree at Teachers College at Columbia University. He is a certified health education specialist, has worked at the Bureau of HIV AIDS Prevention and Control within the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. He has been an instructor at Teachers College at Columbia University and has a certificate in the health disparity reduction. So without further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Groskopf to come up and share his research with us. Dr. <coughs> Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming in the midst of uh, what I'm sure is a very busy day for all of you already. Um, I first want to take a second to thank President Keyes, Provost Griffith, Assistant Provost Henke, uh, Dr. Julie Chukwu, Department Chair, uh, Dr. Brodsky, my colleagues in the department, uh, as well as all of my students who've come out to support me and my friends. So thank you. 
Okay, so I always like to start any lecture or what I like to call a talk with an agenda so you know what's coming down the pike. Uh, and I really, I, I want to stress the word talk because at the end I'd really like this to be a discussion. Um, and I'm hoping that you'll have plenty of questions and comments and concerns to share with me and uh, the rest of us in the room. And I hope that this won't just be a didactic sort of experience where I talk to you and then you leave and you know, you go home and marinate on, uh, then. So first we're going to... First, we're going to talk briefly about the progressive state of sex research because a lot has changed in the past 50 to 60 years regarding how we look at sexuality in terms of research. Um, then I want to speak briefly on the recent online social networking phenomenon, specifically social networking among men who have sex with men, both past and present. Uh, then I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the men who have sex with men community and HIV. We heard um, Dr. Brodsky and Assistant Provost Henke uh, talk briefly about the uh, trends currently with HIV infections, and yes, H I, uh, excuse me, HIV in uh, DC is um, you know at an all-time high, higher than New York. New York used to be the highest, and now DC has surpassed us. Uh, then the the study at hand. I'm going to discuss uh, how the study was conducted, uh, some of the results and the analyses, and then hopefully we'll be able to dialogue and have some questions and answers. Okay, so first, the progressive state of sex researchers, the greats. You know in English we have Chaucer and Shakespeare. Well, in sex research we have our greats too. And uh, first, uh, really our first contributor was Richard von Kraft Ebbing. Uh, he was around during the late uh, 19th century. He was a Viennese psychiatrist. And he was really uh, responsible for outlining a lot of the uh, pathology, uh, well, what used to be uh, pathologized sexual behaviors, now we look at the more as sexual variations. We don't like to use those stigmatizing words such as pathologies when we talk about sexual behaviors that are outside the norm. Um, he coined phrases such as sadomasochism and transvestite. Then we have Sigmund Freud. Uh, and I'm sure all of you, if you've taken a Psych 101 course, you've heard of Freud and the five stages of psychosexual development, the Oedipus and electric, uh, Electra complexes. Um, he was around during the early uh, 20th century uh, he focused largely on neuroses, <coughs> and right now he's really, in terms of sex researchers, just of historical interest. We don't rely much on his theory anymore. Uh, then we have Havelock Ellis, uh, and he brought to the forefront the, re forefront the relativity of sexual val values uh, and how we place our value systems within our sexuality. Uh, he spoke of the norm normality of masturbation, sexual equality for both men and women, as well as the reevaluation of what normal actually means. And when I'm teaching my classes, I, I don't really, I use normative talking about trends in data, but I don't like to use the word normal because normal is whatever feels good and it's consensual and good for you and great for you and your partner. Then we have Alfred Kinsey, which I'm sure all of you have heard of as well. Uh, he really, uh, in, in the 1950s brought diversity in sexual behavior to the forefront with um, many of his studies, well, of the two major studies that he did. And he focused on, again, what is normal versus abnormal and came up with what we call the Kinsey scale, which is a scale ranging from zero to six. Zero represents exclusively heterosexual behavior, while six represents uh, exclusively homosexual behavior or same-sex sexual behavior. And he found out that most of us fall in between, actually. None of us are really zeros or six, or very few of us are, are, are at either end of that spectrum. And then we have Virginia Masters and William Johnson, who really focused on the physiology of the human sexual response cycle. They found out that men and women are very similar in terms of our sexual response, excitement through climax. And they also focused uh, very specifically on clitoral stimulation and discovered that the clitoris is the only organ uh, in, in both men and women that, is produ or that uh, produces pure pleasure. It's not used for reproductive purposes. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about a few uh, contemporary measures to uh, assess sexuality and sexual behavior uh, nationally or on a larger scale. First we have the National Sex and Social Life Survey. And this was the first study to explore the social context of sexuality. And it found, it, was, it is one of the most largest and comprehensive studies of sexual behavior to date. However, it, pr it is a little bit controversial in uh, its measures. However, it did find that Americans are largely exclusive and most Americans have only one or two partners at any given point in time. And it also found that most Americans are, uh, they, most Americans only have sex about once a week. 
which for some of you may be disheartening to hear. But <laughs> <laughs> um, then we have the National Survey of Family Growth. And this was a, uh, a study that really looked at who has sex with whom and when. And it found out that among 25 to 44 year olds, uh, this is just one finding that they, that they have uh, cited in the literature, 97% of men and 98% of women had had vaginal intercourse at least once, which is a large portion of individuals. Uh, although that can be skewed based on social desirability and so on and so forth, which we'll talk about a little later. Then we have the Youth, youth Risk Behavior Survey, which assesses uh, sexual decision making and risk taking among adolescents. Uh, things such as uh, risk, risk behavior in terms of STI infections, sexually transmitted infections, um, pregnancy, uh, and other sorts of risk behaviors associated with drug use uh, and whatnot. And then we have the American College Health Association National College Health Assessment, and this was delivered to campuses or administered to campuses throughout the United States since 2000. And this basically uh, is administered uh, in order to paint a picture of college uh, risk taking and decision making. Uh, in late adolescence and early adulthood. Okay, so when we're talking about sex research, there are a couple things I'd like to point out in terms of methods, and this is so that I don't have to explain later, well, why did you do this, uh, you know, this in the study this way, or why did you choose to do it that way? So hopefully this will clear things up in the forefront. Um, three of the big issues we have in terms of ethical issues in sex research are informed consent, uh, protection from harm, and confidentiality. Because when you're collecting data about individual sexuality, identity, sexual behaviors, this is often very um, personal stuff. And we don't want, or we want to do whatever we can as researchers to make sure that we are not sharing this information. I actually uh, had a problem when I brought my, my initial version of my um, survey to the IRB at Teachers College. They did not let it through because I was asking specific information about specific risk behaviors and body fluids in terms of how HIV is transmitted. And they said, why do you want to know all of this? You're prying into people's you know, personal lives way too much. And I had to go back and explain, well, I want to assess levels of risk. There's a hierarchy of risk. I want to know who's doing what, when, to whom, and how, so that I can figure out how to best, best address them in terms of prevention. So then they understood. And I had to modify some questions, but we came to an agreement. In terms of sampling, uh, studies on sexual behavior are largely biased in the sense that um, we usually use volunteers, which limits uh, the, the uh, generalizability of the results. Um, many studies are done on college students because those are the, the individuals that we as sex researchers have access to the easiest usually. Um, and we have a, a real problem in sampling non-normative sexualities, individuals who fall outside of that range of normal or normative sexual behavior. Uh, here are some methods in terms of data collection for sex research. We have clinical uh, data collection in which you know, a therapist, a psychologist, or psychiatrist would, would uh, see an individual, uh, gather data that way, and then report that out. The problem with this is that therapists or clinicians usually only see individuals who are suffering from sexual dysfunctions. Uh, which again skews the data. Oh my gosh, look at all of these people who can't achieve erections. Well, only the people who can't achieve erections are coming to you. So obviously this is going to skew the data. Well, we would hope. Um, then survey, which is uh, the survey method, which is quite popular. Um, a problem with this, however, is that sexual behavior is self-reported in this sense. So we actually don't know if you're doing what, you're si what you say you're doing. If I ask you about anal sex, you don't want to tell me you're having anal sex, you know, because maybe they're, you know, someone next to you is filling up the survey. You don't want them to know that you've had anal sex 12 times this week. Uh, you maybe you say, oh, I only had it once, and I was wearing a condom even though you weren't. Um, so we do have that self-report issue when it comes to surveys. There's observational uh, data collection methods, which that's pretty self, you know, explanatory. <laughs> and then we have, uh, which I don't know many researchers who go and do that. Uh, or get permission from their IRB to do that. You have to be pretty progressive. And then we have experimental, which is largely based on intervention studies, testing and intervention. Okay, we have a control group. Uh, I'm a, a faculty affiliate at the Center for HIV Educational Studies and Training, at, which is based through Hunter. We have a couple of um, intervention-based studies going on now in which we're enrolling uh, men who have sex with men who are using crystal meth or they're, they're reporting consistent um, unprotected sex. We have a control group who receive a standard or basic uh, prevention and education intervention, and then we have the actual 
clinical intervention, which is our experimental group. Okay, so I just want to talk next on some emerging perspectives in sex research. Uh, in terms of feminist perspective, there's no one single feminist perspective in sex researchers, sex research. However, uh, most research, uh, when it deals with feminist perspectives, is focused on gender and the role of women in, uh, in sex and sexuality. Ethnicity and sexuality. We know that uh, socioeconomic status, particularly education, is the single best indicator of health in this country. Uh, and, and by assessing that and looking at sexual behavior, and, uh, and morbidity and mortality, it, it paints a, a better picture in terms of um, risk assessment. Uh, I also want to comment that uh, although I, I often say in my sex and, se sex and sex sexuality class we live in a sexually disabled society, uh, meaning that even though you want to be a non-biased researcher, you know, uh, your, your, stere your preconceived stereotypes, your experiences and whatnot come with you when designing studies come with you when, when talking with individuals, uh, when delivering uh, interventions and so on and so forth. Um, so, the you know, we have some stereotypes, uh, ethnic stereotypes, gender stereotypes that may taint uh, the way that we um, assess behavior sexually. Um, research with non-normative sexualities. Again, uh, it's very difficult to, I we were just were talking in my class last week about um, paraphilias and sexual variation. You know, if you want to study someone who's into um, pedophilia, for example, it's going to be very difficult to gather, you know, a representative group of individuals who are willing to talk about their sexual behavior with children. Um, and often, when we're dealing with non-normative sexualities, there is that moralistic, uh, puritanical. May even though you may not want to admit it or you may not see it consciously, it does come with the package a lot of the time. So we're constantly, as sex researchers, having to reevaluate uh, how we're approaching the issues and, and where our bi biases and uh, notions are. And then I want to talk specifically about research with lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals. And uh, when I even say that phrase, or LGBT uh, individuals or the LGBT community, that in itself is sort of uh, double-sided because in that phrase we're talking about people who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, or transgender. You'll notice the title of my lecture is Men Who Have Sex With Men, which focuses on behavior. So when we're talking about individuals in terms of who they sleep with and gender, you know, you cannot have a sexual orientation without the social construct of gender. If you don't believe in a gender, then how can you say you're sleeping with a man or a woman? So without gender, we don't have sexual orientation. So if you look at sex research with LGBT individuals or, or with people that sleep with members of the same gender, you'll see how it's kind of convoluted in earlier years and it becomes more specific. Now the trend is to really focus on behavior in terms of disease prevention, but if we're looking at predisposing, enabling, and reinforcing factors that lead to risky behavior, those studies tend to focus more on attraction or orientation and identity. What is going on in terms of this person's sexual orientation and identity that may be causing them to behave in, in risk or to engage in risky sex, sex uh, situations sexually. What is it about the attraction and how does that connect to identity and how does that connect to behavior? Now for most of us all three of those agree. We may be attracted to the opposite uh, gender, we may have sex with the opposite gender, and we may identify as an individual, a heterosexual that has sex with the opposite gender. Sometimes one don't agree with the other, one doesn't agree with the other two, Sometimes two are the same and the other isn't, and this can cause some issues in terms of, of risk uh, behavior. Okay, so now I want to shift talk to uh, online social networking. And for the purposes of this lecture, I sort of classified them in three different areas. We have general, which is social networking that you can use, uh, I'm talking about online specifically, in a for a variety of reasons, such as Facebook, MySpace, Friendster. Um, I myself have a Facebook account, you know, because uh, this is my interest. So uh, we're actually at the, uh, at CHEST, at the research center, we actually, well, it was last semester, we submitted a proposal to deliver uh, motivational interviewing. I'm not sure if, if anyone knows what that is, but it's uh, a method for eliciting ambivalence and desire to change behavior among individuals. We're looking at delivering that sort of intervention on Facebook in Facebook chat via peer networking, which is pretty interesting if you think about it. Um, but 
I chose those three because those are, are pretty popular, although I don't know anyone who really uses Friendster anymore. But we have those, gen <laughs> those general uh, social networking websites. You know, you can just meet people as friends. Maybe you can meet someone for a date, or you just want to post pictures, or you want to chat with people, whatever. Then we have sexuality specific. And when I mean sexuality specific, I mean all realms of sexuality, uh, such as chemistry and eHarmony. However, eHarmony, strangely enough, does not allow people who sleep with or are interested or attracted to members of the same gender to register for their site. If you are gay, you cannot be a member of eHarmony. And then sexual niche specific to the uh, MSM community. Uh, and I actually um, gathered my data via several of these sites. We have gay.com, a website called Adam for Adam, uh, which specifically in New York City is largely popula populated by men of color. Uh, and then Black Gay Chat and Men For Now. And those are, they say they're online social networking, but I'm actually going to show you an image of, from one of the websites, and you can see that it's pretty hypersexual. Okay, they're, the, the uh, intentions of members who join the website, if they're not interested in, in hooking up or meeting someone for sex, chances are they may be turned on when they log onto the website and things may go that way. So it's pretty suggestive <laughs> if you ask me. <coughs> okay. Social networking uh, with men who have sex with men. And I just want to uh, point out that um, before the internet, before 1994, 1995, uh, most men who identified as gay and were comfortable uh, meeting other gay men out in the open used traditional venues such as uh, bars, clubs, saunas, parks, things of that nature. because. In our society, when we meet someone, we automatically, whether it's conscious or subconscious, assume that an individual is heterosexual unless there's some sort of you know, reason for us not to in terms of maybe their gender you know, identity or how they're expressing themselves. Um, but now, with the uh, invention of the internet and the you know, ubiquitous uh, use of the internet, we have these new venues, these online venues, which offer a different way for uh, stigmatized or marginalized communities to come together, um, regardless of where they may be, uh, location or geographically. Um, so we have, you still have individuals who will meet in the traditional venues, but now you have this growing number of individuals who will only meet online. And some, uh, some members of the, of the gay community have argued that the internet is destroying the gay community, you know, people aren't meeting like they used to and forming friendships. Everyone's just going online, meeting individuals, and, you know, meeting up for sex. And there's no sort of camaraderie, there's no solidarity anymore in the community. Um, and maybe that will be a topic of discussion later. So, in terms of online communities, some of the benefits for men who have sex with men or gay men are anonymity. You can put anybody's photo on there. You can say you're 20 years younger than you are. You know, if you're just coming out and realizing that you're attracted to the member of, or a member of the same sex, uh, you don't have to, you know, put yourself out there and go to a bar or a club or the center or whatnot and meet other individuals and, be, you know, be scared out of your mind. You can just log on, create a fictitious profile just to chat, sort of slowly merge yourself into the community. Um, and selectivity. And this is especially important for those who are interested in sex, in my personal opinion. Uh, the website uh, that I'm going to show you, uh, which is one that we use to collect data, uh, actually has, when you fill out a profile to become a member, you can put in your penis size, your height, your weight, uh, what kind of sexual behavior you're interested in, your hair color, your eye color, uh, uh, whether or not you're escorting, all kinds of information. And then you can actually, when a member, search by that. So it's like designer babies. This is designer sex partners. Basically, okay, you know, I want someone with you know brown hair, blue eyes, six foot two, within this weight range. They even have ranges, so you can search within that too. It's really crazy. Uh, drawbacks. Well, this creates an inability to reach in terms of health promotion. If we want to promote safer sex, if we want to promote mental health, if we want to do X, Y, and Z in terms of making these men healthier, this poses an obstacle. Uh, it's much easier to go into a bar and put a condom jar in there, or go and put a poster or go out you know, as researchers or health educators and talk to men, or pull, uh, park a mobile van testing unit, HIV testing van, out in front of a bar and try to snag people that way and give them metro cards or offer them food or movie tickets in order to get tested or you know, to, to give them a 30-second you know, sound bite on how to protect themselves or give them condoms or lube or whatever it may be. You can't do that on the internet. 
okay? And that's what sort of the impetus for this study was. You know, how cost effective is it to design interventions that are internet based that will do maybe or at least slightly what we were doing out in the field? Okay. So this is just a quote from an article by Banash, Kalishman, and Cage. Uh, they cite that over the past decade, the internet has become a popular venue for gay men, and I, I put in here men who have sex with men because I was focusing on behavior, not necessarily identity, uh, to exchange information, discuss political and other issues of interest, converse in chat rooms, and place and correspond to personal ads or to partake in cyber sex fantasies, which they define as erotic discussions and fantasies online without any face-to-face -face contact, in an anonymous fashion without fear of reprisal. So that sort of speaks to the... Uh, the point that I was talking about um, in terms of being able to go online and not being afraid of exploring maybe fantasies or, uh, that you may have or talking to members of the same gender. Okay, so men who have sex with men and HIV. And I'm going to talk specifically about New York City now. Uh, well, when we, see, when we hear the word HIV for years and years and years, it was automatically associated for many of us with men who have sex with men or gay men. There's a stigma still today surrounding HIV that this is a gay disease or that it's, you know, the most prevalent among men who have sex with men. Um, you know, if you can think back to the early 80s, it was first called gay-related immunodeficiency disease or GRID. Uh, it had, a, you know, the word gay in its name. Um, and that has carried, you know, uh, itself throughout, you know, the, the 25 years that we've been dealing with this, the 25, 26 years that we've been dealing with this, this devastating disease. Um, in terms of research priorities, Again, it's HIV is sort of synonymous with men who have sex with men. If you want to do research with men who have sex with men, there is a lot of money in terms of HIV okay, prevention. I'm actually working on uh, a, an RO3 right now with a colleague at St. Louis University looking at men who, uh, men who have sex with men who are HIV positive and smoking cessation because there's uh, evidence to um, support that Smoking cessation, uh, or excuse me, smoking and being on HIV meds can cause some complications. So, still, men who have sex with men and HIV is thrown in there. Um, so, some, some statistics on HIV among men who have sex with men in New York City. And this is preliminary data from 2006 from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene here. Uh, one in 10 MSM in New York City <coughs> is infected with HIV. That's one in four in Chelsea, in the Chelsea neighborhood in Manhattan. Um, young men who have sex with men who are under 30 years of age uh, account for 33% of all new infections in the past six years. Okay, so that's over one, th well, about one third. Um, new diagnoses among young men who have sex with men ages 13 to 19 have doubled in the past six years. This is really shocking to me. 90% of young men who have sex with men under 20 diagnosed in 2006 were either African American or Hispanic. That's insane. And yet, and I will talk about this a little later, in terms of rec recruiting uh, young men of color in research studies, um, and we can you know, talk about uh, the Tuskegee syphilis study and distrust you know, for the medical community and research uh, you know, for hours and hours and hours, but that's of real interest to me. How do we get men of color who are obviously being infected and greatly affected by this disease, how do we get their feedback? How do we get their input in terms of data? Um, kind of, you know, put up my hands. Uh, and then every borough except Staten Island has seen increases in infection since 2001. Okay. I mean, I don't want to, you know, sound, I don't want to sound overly positive, but uh, it is good news to know that we are now not number one in terms of infection, uh, DC is. What explains yes. the Staten Island reality? What, it, what explains? What explains the Staten Island that the Why do I think that that's the case? Um, well, if you look at, th there are a number of reasons. I mean, there could be the fact that it's so disconnected from the rest of the city. Um, the ethnic makeup of Staten Island is quite different than the other boroughs. Um, I mean, that would be my, my first guess. Does that answer your question? It's sort of like, I, I don't know, you know. I, I don't know. We, I mean, we, we could talk about it. Um, I've actually never been to Staten Island, so. <laughs> 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 so maybe I shouldn't be saying these things. Uh, so, 
I want to talk briefly about uh, intervention efforts um, geared towards HIV uh, with men who have sex with men. Um, there's been a shift from community level interven interventions to individual level interventions and a shift from primary prevention to secondary and tertiary prevention. And for those of you who are not in health promotion, primary uh, prevention is, is really about education and uh, pre preventative treatment before you acquire a disease or behavior. Uh, secondary is early detection and treatment of either a behavior or disease, and then tertiary is really re rehabilitation. So in the beginning, because of the lack of antiretrovirals uh, for HIV, you had a lot of uh, MSM who were being infected and becoming um, diagnosed with AIDS very quickly. Now because of the drugs, you know, people are able to live a lot longer before they're diagnosed with AIDS. But uh, there was a very big push in terms of community level interventions to prevent HIV uh, via primary prevention in the beginning of the disease. However, so many men were becoming, po were becoming positive so quickly, there was a shift to more individualized uh, prevention in terms of early detection, get tested for HIV, and if you are positive, go on medication as quickly as possible. And now we have what's called uh, prevention for positives. So looking at those who are already infected with HIV and preventing them from infecting others or being in, becoming infected with another strain. Or, you know, syphilis or gonorrhea because if one is HIV positive, it's much easier to get uh, another infection. So trends of MSM online. And I don't want to stigmatize this community whatsoever. Um, there are many reasons why men go online and we actually assess some of those reasons in the study. Um, many men go on, you know, just to look at pornography or, or to talk with friends or maybe they're browsing the social mark, uh, the hypersexual social, not social marketing, I'm sorry, social networking websites, but not actually meeting anyone. Um, maybe they're gaming, maybe they're shopping. You know, there are many reasons why men go online. Uh, however, several studies have shown uh, in comparing offline and online samples of men, the men who are online seeking uh, sex online do engage in riskier behavior. And these are some of the studies that have shown that. <coughs> okay, so before I start talking about the study, I want to just uh, give you some food for thought in terms of questions. And these are some questions I have myself still after doing this. Uh, the first one, should internet-based interventions mimic those delivered in traditional settings? Okay, we have primary and secondary uh, interventions in traditional settings targeting MSM, bars, clubs, health clinics, so on and so forth. How do we and should we apply those same methods to the internet? And now there's, uh, and, and, and you know, just thinking about this, there's now texting and there's an application for the iPhone called Looped. I don't know if anybody's heard of this. It actually identifies where you are via your GPS and your iPhone and tells you who's closest to you. And you can send them email messages. And you can actually search by gender and interest in terms of orientation. So I could actually click and find all of the gay men in the neighborhood who are closest to me and send them email. I've actually gone to you know, a, a, a bar and done that and said, oh look, Tom is the closest one to, Tom, are you in here, Tom? No. So how could we, how could we use that? How could we use that to develop an intervention? You know, I mean, th there's like the possibilities are endless, but is it, is it worth the time, money, and effort? Um, what is the feasibility of delivering online HIV prevention interventions? There's a great site, uh, um, and again, when I'm teaching my sex and sexuality course, I always tell my students, don't assume what I'm telling you is, is true about myself and that I, I do this. Uh, there's a great site called Nubian 101. Uh, which is a free uh, pornography site of short online um, streaming videos, but before every video, you're forced to watch a 15 to 30 second clip on safer sex. And they're very culturally um, sensitive and relevant. Um, however, I don't know if I'm worried about the people who are, on are at home masturbating to porn because chances are they're probably doing it alone. So, um, which is fine, which is great, you know, support masturbation. Um, <laughs> Uh, and how will the results of this study and like studies impact work in health promotion overall? And how can we apply what, we've, what we learn in studies like this to other areas of health promotion and risk behavior and disease? Okay, so the present study and rationale. Men who have sex with men in New York City can tear the, continue to bear the burden of disparities in HIV infection. And like I said, according to the uh, Department of Health, infection rates of MSM uh, under 30 have gone up 33% in the past six years. Uh, the internet may be a new medium for high-risk sexual behaviors. Um, 
men who are less comfortable with identifying as gay or, or as a gay or homosexual might use the internet to look for sex partners versus using those traditional venues um, because they can mask parts of their identity and remain anonymous. And this is, I'm just basically summarizing everything I've just said. Uh, the main, so the main purpose of this study was to describe the sexual behaviors of New York City men who have sex with men who seek sex online, as well as their attitudes toward online HIV prevention and education. So this, in a large, in large part, was a feasibility study. Okay, so a little bit about recruitment, sampling, and data collection for the study. This was a, a cross-sectional study conducted during the months of January through Feb January 2008 and February 2008. So it was actually only two months. Um, if you remember back earlier, I was talking about some of the sampling issues when working with uh, um, sex, sexual variables and, se and sex behavior. We had to rely on a convenient sample. It's not that I could randomly go out uh, and, f and choose, you know, 10 men who have sex with men randomly, you know, out in the world and have them and come and take a survey. It was, you know, sort of, please take my survey, come in. Um, via the recommendation of gay men's health crisis, uh, gay men of uh, African descent, um, Cal and Lord Health Center, several organizations that serve uh, men, the men who have sex with men community, they recommended uh, a, a list of sites that I should contact in terms of advertising the survey on these sites because it was an internet delivered survey. Um, and these are the three that I received permission from. And so this is where we collected data. Gay.com, Adam for Adam, and Craigslist. And you may say, I only use Craigslist to buy and sell furniture or toys or whatnot. No, there is a sex seeking portion to Craigslist. Okay, if you haven't seen it already. Some of you have, I, I gather, <laughs> while you're nodding. Um, and then, of course, I used my own social networks and sent out, you know, uh, scads of emails and asked people, my friends and, and you know, colleagues, if, if they could also participate in the survey. So, uh, Many of the sites that I contacted had turned me down. They said, if you want to advertise, you have to pay for a banner <laughs> on the website. Uh, our members are really agitated by sex researchers on the websites, and they, you know, they'll, they'll complain to us, so we don't want you to do it. So, yeah, at about, out of about 12, I only got a quarter of them to agree. Okay, oh, before I show you that, <laughs> I wanted to, sorry, I'm not paying attention to my notes. The next slide, okay, the next slide, it is a little, it, it is a little, uh, a little scandalous, if you will. And the purpose of this, okay, all right, the purpose of this is to show you um, how hypersexual these sites are. And in terms of agencies, organizations, or researchers that want to put um, interventions, whether it be social marketing campaigns, uh, videos, um, ads, whatever it may be, banners on these sites, they're going to be competing with other companies that are maybe advertising sex toys or pornography or whatnot on these websites. So, you know, you're going to have to create an ad that can stand against, you know, the cover of a pornographic movie title. Okay, and so that's why it is, like I said, a little graphic, but this is an example of one of our online recruitment profiles. Okay. Um, this is a stock image, I don't actually know who that is, but this is an example of what uh, men would see if they're cruising, you know, uh, the, this site for sex. Uh, this picture would actually appear smaller on a, on a page of pictures, a bunch of page of pictures, and it would just list, I think, the age and the height or something like that. Uh, then you could actually click on it, and uh, I only had one primary pick. Uh, th this, th the text says, questions about sex, STDs, HIV, I'm here to help. Uh, do you meet guys online, have questions about STDs, HIV? This is the link to the survey. Uh, this is, you can put what your interests are and then what your occupation is. I just said health educator. Um, I was not allowed, obviously all this was approved by the IRB. Um, I was not allowed to contact men. I couldn't, you know, hit on somebody's profile and say, hey, want to take a survey? You can get a Best Buy certificate in a raffle. I was only allowed to answer. I was only allowed to answer certain questions about HIV or STIs if the men contacted me. And a lot of men, let me tell you, based on that picture, contacted me and are like, "Hey, do you want to meet up at six o'clock? Do you want to do this, that, and thing?" I just had to ignore them, you know, unless it was uh, specific to what was approved by the IRB. But as you can see, if you wanted to put a prevention ad down here, you know, you couldn't put like a ribbon or a condom or something. They're going to look immediately to that, and not not to your ad. So this poses, you know, some problem on sites that are specifically geared towards sex seeking. Okay, so in terms of the instrumentation for the study, it was housed in an online server at Teachers College called TC Surveys. It was secure, 
Um, I did this, most, a lot of people use SurveyMonkey for their online surveys. If anybody's taken a SurveyMonkey um, questionnaire online, uh, I chose it because I wanted to get online as quickly as possible and because it was based at the university that got through IRB quicker. It consisted of several established scales and one original uh, scale that I developed myself. Um, it included screening criteria, so men were initially screened when they logged onto the, the survey. They had to be uh, over the age of 18, they had to report a New York City zip code and they had to, as a primary residence, uh, and they had to uh, report mostly sex with men in the past year. Okay, so if they had sex once, that didn't count. They had to actually click mostly men. Um, then we had the sexual, sen sensual, sexual sensation seeking scale, which uh, is a, uh, a set of questions um, assessing sexual adventurism among the men. We had an HIV optimism skepticism scale, which uh, were a few questions assessing how men how optimistic men were about becoming infected, dealing with the daily regimens in terms of medications, um, how they would be viewed in society in terms of being HIV positive. So I, it's kind of confusing. The more optimistic men are, the more comfortable they are with being HIV positive or being, um, or, be, or about HIV. Uh, then we had the internet usage questionnaire, uh, which was um, John Elford's instrument, which asked questions about general internet use as well as sexual behavior related to internet use. So what do you use the internet for? How many guys are you meeting offline? What are you doing with them offline? So on and so forth. We had a demographic, a demographic questionnaire which, was based, which is based on the community health survey distributed by the New York City Department of Health and an original online HIV prevention attitudes and belief scale which is what I developed. Okay, so I developed a, a table of specifications for my original instrument, which uh, if you're not sure what that is, it basically takes a look at all of the constructs that you're assessing or you want to assess, how you're going to assess them, and then sample items on your survey. Okay, so it was grounded in three health behavior theories, the health belief model, the trans, theor trans theoretical model or stages of change, and social cognitive theory. Uh, these are not all of the constructs that were assessed, but these are just a few of them. Perceived susceptibility, uh, cues to action in terms of changing uh, risky behaviors, reinforcement, if I'm protecting myself, how do I continue to do that, or what's gonna keep me uh, doing that, and then stage of change. If I'm not even thinking about using a condom when I'm having sex, uh, how do I get from there to thinking about it? How do I move to now actually having a plan or preparing to negotiate with my partner when I'm, you know, that I've just met off the internet, hey, we need to use a condom versus not being able to do that. Okay, these are, just, these are just some sample items that were on the original questionnaire. The guys, and these were um, asked using a, like, a Likert scale from one to five. Strongly disagree with the statement to strongly agree with the statement. The guys I meet online for sex are more likely to put me at risk for HIV than those I meet for sex in other places. I don't think about safer sex until I see a message reminding me to protect myself. And seeing a prevention message online would probably increase my interest and confidence to seek more information offline. And then in terms of validity, um, a five-person expert panel was used to establish face validity, but we did not actually go beyond that um, because of money and, and time and so on. Uh, I actually have applied for the PSC CUNY grant money to redesign this instrument and make it uh, you know, more effective and hopefully achieve uh, different levels of, of validity beyond face. Okay, uh, data analysis. We, in terms of, this was a very descriptive heavy study, we looked at demographics, internet use, sexual behavior, uh, HIV optimism versus skepticism, sexual sensation seeking or sexual adventurism, and then of course the attitudes and beliefs toward online uh, HIV prevention. In terms of uh, inferences, we wanted to also look at uh, the best predictors of high risk sex in the last 12 months, which we defined as anal sex without a condom with at least one individual. Um, and I uh, first looked at three months and then looked at 12 months and, and looked at the, the differences there. They were very similar and I'm actually going to show them to you in the, I believe the next slide. Okay, I know this is probably hard to see some of these numbers so I'm just gonna point out the big ones. So first, uh, we split the men into those initially, those men who were not seeking sex partners online, who did not log onto these websites specifically to seek sex, sex partners and those who did. Okay, and then we ran t-tests to look at uh, differences uh, in the means of these two groups. And really the only statistically significant difference we found in these two groups was age, because and the mean age for those 
who were seeking partners online was 30 versus 27 for those who didn't, which is not practically significant. It's you know, three years, which is not, not a huge difference. But I do want to point out that in both groups, the sample, was ma the majority was white, even though I was targeting two websites that were heavily populated by men of color. And I did that on purpose. Um, you also see that they're very well educated. Uh, only 21% in the, in the sample of men who were seeking partners online had less than a four-year college degree. Only 21%. The other 80 were college educated or more. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say about that. Yeah, and then I talked about the age. Okay. So this next table shows the attitudes and behaviors of men uh, seeking sex partners online in the last year. You'll see the number one reason among men who were seeking sex partners or who were on, on those websites to seek sex partners is because it was entertaining and exciting when they were bored. But the number two reason was to find sexual partners. That's why they were on. And this is even more, more exciting to me. I mean, it could be shocking, more exciting. The question was asked in terms of behavior, how many, last, how many of your last five sex partners did you meet on the internet? Five or more? The majority said five the highest number, 35% of the men. Uh, and then down here, these are behaviors with men who they've met online. In the last three months, 84% of men who were on these websites met someone in person that they met online. 73% of them had oral sex, 49.7% of them had anal sex, and then about 18% had anal sex without a condom. In terms of the last 12 months, which is what we looked at when looking at predictors, 98% of men who were on these websites had met at least one person they met online in person. Wait, I just repeated myself. You know what I'm trying to say, right? 91% uh, had had oral sex, 64% had had anal sex, and about 30%, almost 30% had had anal sex without a condom. Now I know that sounds you know, pretty scary, but the good thing is, is that these numbers suggest that many men are using oral sex as an alternative to anal sex, which is good. Okay, only 30% had anal sex without a condom. So the other, uh, you know, 70, 71% are not having anal sex without a condom, which is a good thing. That's positive. We didn't want the numbers to be re reversed. Okay. So now we're, we then split the groups of those who had met men offline for sex into those who used a condom and to those who didn't. All right. And we found two... In terms of, again, we ran t-tests to look for uh, differences in the means of the groups, and we found two significant numbers. We found that sexual adventurism and HIV optimism skepticism were both stati statistically significant in those groups. So, meaning, none of this mattered in terms of, none of, in terms of income, ethnicity, education, employment. There was no difference between those who used condoms and those who didn't, but in terms of adventurism or sexual sensation seeking and how optimistic men felt about HIV infection and HIV medications in that process, there was a statistically significant difference. Okay, only in those two areas. So, we also found, and I'm reading off the bottom of the slide now, there was a weak positive uh, statistically significant correlation also found between adventurism and, op and optimism. So not only did we find that these were uh, significant between the two groups, we also found, found that b uh, between those two, there was a relationship, a positive relationship. So as adventurism goes up, so does optimism. The more adventurous you are, the more likely you are to be uh, optimistic about HIV. So based on, oh, I don't want to jump ahead of myself. We also looked at how men um, felt towards online interventions, which is you know, the title of this presentation. Uh, and basically what we did is we aggregated the responses. And there were three subscales. There was an accessibility and responsiveness subscale, an ability to change behavior and social support, and we're talking about inter online interventions, and then utility and expectancy. And what we did is, again, these were Likert scales. We uh, took all men who reported um, strongly disagree through neutral for each of the items and lumped that into a no category. So if, you, if the question was, do you think online interventions are accessible and do you think people would be responsive to them? If the, uh, the participant said, strongly disagree, disagree, or I don't feel either way, they were lumped into the no category. If they said agree or, dis or strongly agree, they were lumped into the yes cat category and we, we created those two binary categories uh, 
in terms of aggregating the data. So if you'll see, in each category, these two, and by the way, these th three subscales, they achieved very uh, high levels of, of internal consistency. Alpha for, for the first one, I think, was 0.89. I think this was 0.9, and this was actually 0.87, which is quite, quite high. Um, but as you can see, in each, the yeses, this one not so much, I mean 57 versus 42. But in terms of utility and expectancy and uh, accessibility and responsiveness, the majority of the men were very positive towards online interventions. Okay. Okay, so based on the correlation between adventurism and optimism and based on the fact that um, the, the averages uh, between the two groups, men who, uh, men who used condoms and men who didn't have condoms, this, the two significant variables were optimism and adventurism. It seemed only natural that we would throw these variables into a logistic uh, regression to predict the probability of high-risk sex with a man met online. Okay, so when we did this, we found out that both were actual predictors of high-risk sex. Uh, and I'm not going to go into it, but pseudo R squared was uh, 0 0.24, 24% of the variance in the outcome was explained. And here is a nice uh, chart that shows the likelihood of high-risk sex behavior based on sexual adventurism scores. So we held sexual optimism at, a const at the mean score to constant, and we looked at as sexual adventurism increased, so did the likelihood of high-risk sex. And guess what? HIV optimism looked exactly the same when we flipped it around. Okay, so let me just speak briefly about the study limitations. Uh, the initial eligibility criteria. Because the study limited respondents to those who reported in New York City residents, men who have sex with men who did not live in New York City, maybe Connecticut or Jersey or, or uh, Long Island or, or um, uh, Westchester or whatnot, um, but who still engage with men who have sex with men who lived in New York City may not have been included. So there could be disease transmission crossing city lines, which is quite possible. Um, men who have, who, uh, MSM who reported not having had sex with enough men to be included in the study, but who still sleep with men uh, may have not been included as well. And they may be engaging, maybe they only sleep with two men a year, but those two acts are risky sex. Those men were not included either. either. Non-probability, convenient sampling, uh, because the respondents were not chosen at random, again, it may not be generalizable to all men who have sex with men who seek sex online. Uh, men in the sample were only those who logged into the websites uh, while I was logged on during those two months. Um, and it was only administered in English, the survey. So those who are not comfortable um, reading and responding in English or those who, who don't um, speak English may not have been included. Uh, also, there was no data collected on offline sex-seeking behaviors. I would have liked to have compared an offline sample with an online sample, but the funding time and so on and so forth was not sufficient to do that. Because uh, a lot of men still use offline traditional venues to find men for sex. Um, it was administered through an online server. Uh, because of technological limitations, uh, skip patterns. So if you said, I did not have sex with a man in the past 12 months, or the past three months, on SurveyMonkey, it would have skipped you and asked you about the next 12 months. But this one, this, this uh, survey, um, online survey, uh, was not, did not have that and was not available. So unfortunately, I had to do a lot of cleaning of the data, which, was <laughs> which took a lot of time. Um, also, there was no way to tell if a respondent began the survey, exited it, and then began a new one at a later time. Someone could have done 10 surveys. Uh, I, I deleted if their name, because they were allowed to in a separate area, uh, put in their contact information that was kept separate for a raffle, um, for incentives, but sometimes two or three names would appear more than once. So I had to delete that, and that indicated to me that this individual may have taken the survey more than once, thus skewing the data. Um, the survey link, it, it link that took approximately 25 to 30 minutes to complete, with many surveys um, missing data at the end. So it sort of trailed off. The respondent's environment, and this sounds funny, but uh, it's something to consider as sex researchers who are doing online research. Um, I could not be 
could not be certain if the person who was filling out the survey was actually who they said they were, and I don't know what was going on in their environment while they were taking the survey. Maybe they sat down, they did the initial eligibility criteria, and they were eligible for the survey, then they started perusing porn and were masturbating, and then maybe the phone rang, and then they're doing another part of the survey, and this is, you know, interruptions that can affect responses. I didn't know if that was going on or not, so I couldn't control for it. Um, response bias, because many questions on the survey ask for intimate information regarding sexuality and sexual behavior uh, and mental health, uh, many men have, made, have been reluctant to answer them or based on social desirability may have given me answers they wanted me to hear. Okay, I don't want to, again, tell you about the 12 partners I had um, this week and I only use condoms with one of them. Uh, funding time, it was only collected th for those two months. Um, I was the sole point of contact Data analysis and interpretation, money associated with incentives, uh, and anything else associated with the study fell on me. There was no funding for the study whatsoever, so I had to, to pay for all of it, time and you know, financially. Um, this also decreased the um, number and appeal of the provided study incentives. So if I was offering an incentive to everybody who filled out the survey, that may have increased participation, but I only offered, I think, 10 gift certificates. 235 men accessed the survey, only 195 of them actually filled out enough information to be included in the analyses. Um, and measurement, it used an original instrument, the one that I developed, um, how it, uh, so it left uh, a lot of openness and flexibility. However, uh, this can be a considered a weakness in terms of um, validity. Okay, implications, this is similar to other studies. This study, the, the results are very similar to other studies done with men who, uh, sought, who seek sex online. However, this was the first study to focus on MSM in New York City, a region with endemic rates of, of HIV. Nonetheless, this may paint a helpful picture for practitioners and researchers working with MSM who seek sex online. Uh, the internet is a risk behavior medium. This study showed a significant relationship between adventurism uh, and internet-initiated sex acts, as well as optimism toward HIV infection and HIV medications and treatment options. This may suggest increased opportunities to seek specific types of adventurous and potentially risky sex online. So if we want to target populations, who are we going to target? Those who are HIV optimistic and those who are sexually adventurous. Uh, internet is a potential medium for intervention del delivery. The study indicated that MSM Online in New York City may be open to online HIV prevention. They also indicate that the sample uh, seemed to be most comfortable, and I didn't really go into this, with an interactive type of intervention, uh, like frequently asked questions or some sort of multimedia intervention. Um, GMHC is currently, uh, well, they have been doing uh, several of these types of interventions. Um, however, several of them have not really been evaluated for uh, effectiveness. So I want to quickly show you, and I'm only going to show you one because I know we're, we're getting short on time. Um, I'll just pull up the, these are two interventions that GMHC, Gay Men's Health Crisis in Manhattan, has de have developed over the, or has developed over the uh, years. This one is like, it's called MySexyCity.com. It's an avatar-based um, intervention. And it's basically, you have to go through all of these. This is a site about sex and drugs. Do you agree to enter? Um, I actually did uh, a critique of this, and it's, it's, in my opinion, quite, you know, much too long. My, my thought is, to advertise this, they had little um, uh, coasters and bookmarks. But that's it, to advertise it. So in my opinion, this is sitting up here. It costs, you know, I think almost a million dollars. No, not a million dollars. Uh, um, half a million dollars to construct. And it's not being accessed, you know. But anyway, you... you you can go in, you can choose a character. Each character is different in terms of, of uh, identity and behavior and background and whatnot. Uh, okay, it's not, it's not loading. So that, oh, you can go in here and there's like a bar scene, there's a street scene. Yeah, there's Club Vibrate, Christina Street, and Apartments. You can actually, if you're familiar with avatars, navigate through as one of these characters in si situations and somebody will come up to say, oh, do you want to buy some Tina, which is crystal meth? Yes, and then a box will pop up saying, oh, well, crystal meth can cause this, and you shouldn't do it with poppers or amyl nitrate and you know, Viagra, because you can have a heart attack, and it provides some information. So it's user-centered. However, the advertisement of this product wasn't so great, and I'm hoping that the next one will have sound. This is an intervention uh, 
targeting uh, men of color. And it's very short. But again, where is this going to be delivered and how is it going to be delivered? How are men going to click on this? I mean, I had to go to this site and, and search for the video. I don't know if you're going to be able to... Uh-oh. Can't see it now. I broke it. Oh. Oh. Okay, there's no sound, but... Is there... Here, let me... Can, is there a light? Is it over there? Oh, of course. It's going to get dark in here for a second. All right. Is that better? All right. No, I, I paused it. Okay, so it's... Is there another? There. You can't hear it. There's like some club music playing in the background. He's online. What is that? Yeah. It's much more exciting with the sound. <laughs> again, again, <laughs> hypersexual. Okay, don't worry. There's no nothing too graphic on here. Hypersexual. Um, it did very well with focus groups, focus group testing. Um, but again, the question is, how do you get men online who are on these, you know, social networking websites, watch your eyes, to go to this and look at it? And who's going to sit there if they're trying to hook up with somebody around the block, you know, somebody they can find around, their, around the corner, who's going to sit there and watch, you know, a 30-second message? That's, you know, a question that we need to address. Oh, okay. Stop now. All right. Uh, recommendations for future research. Uh, research endemic areas such as DC, LA specifically, um, focusing with men in those communities. A lot of online research studies. Uh, have, why is this? Okay, well, I'm just going to read from the slides. Maybe it'll go away. Um, <laughs> do we have, we don't have the tech people here. Uh, um, increased sample size and diversity. Again, finding men of color to participate since they're so affected by uh, HIV, especially in cities with endemic rates getting them to participate in the studies. How do we do that? Um, use a larger number of websites from which to collect data and forge relationships with these social networking websites so they don't see us as outsiders and researchers who just want to come in and take their members. A lot of, a lot of these sites you have to pay to become a member. Uh, how do we get in there and forge those, those uh, relationships with them? And a lot of this has to do with enlisting those people working at these community-based organizations that work with MSM. There needs to be a closing, a, a closing of the gap between research and practice. I'm finding that a lot uh, when working with this population. Um, and then working, we want to work toward evaluating the effectiveness of online interventions, past process and outcome monitoring. Let's not develop interventions, focus group test them and say, okay, they work and let's just make a website and dump $500,000 into it. Let's continue to work on that website, fix it, see if the, it's actually effective. Um, and is it, you know, is it worth the money we're putting into it? So again, I want to revisit those questions, and I really wish I could have them back up here. But you know, it's, it did something weird when I went to the internet. Okay, so should internet-based internet interventions mimic those delivered in traditional settings? What is the feasibility of delivering online HIV prevention interventions? And how will the results of this study and studies like this impact work and health promotion overall? And with that, I'm going to close my talking bit of, of the lecture, and hopefully we can have some interactive and interesting discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, why not? Okay. One question is that um, how can we get African American men to um, participate if you know they're having, if you know where they're HIV positive, why don't you have people in the clinic, like where they go to find out their HIV, like right then and there, um, have give them extra do a survey, like make it mandatory it, almost. It's the, the participation rate for offline surveying of, of men is a lot higher among, men, among men of color. But in terms of, of online, that's what I'm really interested in. I mean, it's still lower. Uh, face to face among men of color than it is white men uh, or Caucasian men, but online it's even lower because there is this distrust of you know the medical community of researchers and I'm interested how do we get beyond that hurdle online because it's a lot easier in a clinic to you know you know sort of snag someone 
or in front of a club, you know, in a van, if you want to survey someone and snag them. But like you said, so. how, how do you know they're not going to be lying on the internet? Like, who well, I don't. I do, that's one of the limitations. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if they're lying. Because I'm saying they already, if they already, they already are HIV positive, and you want to find out like who their partner is and what they've done. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be you already know they're HIV positive? So when they come into their medicine or they find out that day, we'll just be serving right there, like ask them, tell them to go out. On, on I, well, this is all anonymous too. I have no idea who these individuals are. If they came into a clinic, and you know, there's. A, there's, there's confidential and anonymous testing. If it's confidential, we know who you are. Um, there's no way to ever know who these individuals are. I mean, I have a, a bank of names, but I, I cannot connect them to their responses. And we actually didn't, which is a, a fault of mine in the design, we didn't ask their HIV status in this survey. Yeah, thank you. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, per capita, the ro the the the, ro the increase is, is higher than the New York, right? Mm -hmm. But would you link it to men having sex with men, or more so like heterosexual sex? Well, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Would I link it to? Link it. Again, you know, the data is is only as good as as the self report So I think personally that there are probably a lot more men who are having sex with men and having sex with women, and there's that transmission transmission happening. Um, Men who have sex with men are nationally the largest group who are infected with HIV. Um, but there has been, you know, uh, women of color have also been, you know, on, on the rise, the, the infections. Yes? When someone, I guess, they get tested, do they, does a health practitioner ask them where they get it from or where they have well, if they, if they test positive, yeah, because they want to be able to notify partners and, and have them tested and, and whatnot. Uh, but again, it's all based on self-report. Yes, ma'am. Professor Lane, yes. yes. Did your study exclude men on the down law, or was there, there wasn't a criteria? The only criteria, there were three, there was three screening items. Age, uh, residence, which is New York City zip code, and behavior with mostly men in the past year. So no, I... Like I said at the beginning, a lot of studies focus on only attraction. A lot of studies will focus on identity, regardless of who they're sleeping with. Mine focused strictly on behavior because that was the, the cause agent for HIV. And actually, I, don't, I can't even say that because they may have gotten HIV from you know, using a, a, a dirty needle, or, for example. So. But I, I didn't assess whether or not they were HIV positive. So, uh, Professor Glazer, and then we'll come over okay. here. Yeah. Um, that was a good question. I was thinking the same thing. Are men who are on the down low at a higher risk for contracting? Well, first, um, and I love Oprah. I DVR her, but um, you know, she she sort of she sort of you know promoted that the whole down low thing. There have been men on the down low for years and years and years. Down low is just a man who does not identify as uh, homosexual or bisexual who may have. Set, who has sex with, with the same gender. You know, this has been happening for years. There are, you know, businessmen who have been picking up, you know, pro, uh, sex workers in the West Village on Greenwich Avenue for a long time and then going home to their wives in New Jersey. Uh, it's, it's the term that's associated with a particular... Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a term that's associated with, with a particular niche. Um, so, uh, it's... I, I, don't, I don't really know how to answer that or answer that question because it, it's the down low phenomenon, though it may not have been, been termed the down low and it may have been among other ethnic or cultural groups, to me has been going on for quite a while. Um, and it may be facilitating you know, infection at greater, rate, greater rates. I think that, I'll get to you and then there are two ladies over here. Uh, thank you, Professor, yeah. for that very enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. I'm certain mm -hmm. many people appreciate that. If I can just address the lady who asked about Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. and when in the February 2009 issue of Essence Magazine, there was an interesting article on HIV infection and women. I happen to have it with me. I'll gladly share this with you. But it's pretty astounding uh, in terms of the HIV rates. And I know we were talking about New York City, but uh, Washington, apparently it says here, nine out of 10 new HIV infected females in Washington, D.C. That's a pretty staggering but yeah, it is, and I would love to share this with you because Essence Magazine has really been doing a lot 
to try to uh, encourage women of color, uh, particularly women of African descent, to become more knowledgeable and educated about this issue. But uh, Professor, what I'd like to kind of transition into is to try to understand why men of color, particularly those of African descent, don't seem to be responding to educational outreach efforts because your uh, statistics are staggering and quite disturbing. I don't, I, I don't know, what do we do? I think it, it really goes back to, and I, I believe I mentioned uh, this briefly in the beginning, um, I'm really concerned that, um, and I teach uh, health promotion program planning uh, for the department, and you know, I teach my students to, first we have to look at the quality of life or the health problem, which in this case would be HIV infection. Then you look at the behavioral or environmental determinants. What are they doing that's causing HIV? Well, we know how HIV is transmitted. Then we have to look to lack of knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, values, skills, um, access, uh, and quality, access to and quality of care, and then, any, and then any sort of positive or negative reinforcement in the community or among their peers. And based on those, they design the programs. So if it's a lack of knowledge, they would design a program to address knowledge. If it's changing values, a value system, they would, they would design a program to do that based on you know, data that we would collect in the community and then what the research literature shows. We don't just address behavior. Something leads to behavior. So something is leading to risky behavior. You can say, wear a condom, wear a condom, uh, don't have risky sex. You can, but I don't think that we can just stop there. There's something going on in terms of those predisposing, enabling, and reinforcing factors that needs to be addressed. And that's why I, was, uh, I spoke briefly on coming at it from a more holistic health approach, maybe even a, you know, a, a strictly mental health approach. Okay. What do we have to change intrinsically to motivate them to want to be safer or negotiate safer sex with their partners or you know, at least feel comfortable negotiating safer sex with their partners? If I could just follow up, and I appreciate mm -hmm. your response. I'm wondering if uh, the fact that many men of African descent feel like, feel like outsiders in their very own country, if that's one of the reasons they're not responding. I'm just uh, offering that. But um, you know, I appreciate uh, everything that you've said today because I try to be active in our community. I, I attend a community council meeting, and we've been talking about these types of issues. We meet every Tuesday, one, one Tuesday in the month. And we're really concerned, in particular, about young people uh, because, mm -hmm. these, again, these statistics are very concerning. Yeah. Yeah, let me interject for one second. Uh, you're going to look at it as a very serious issue. One of the things that you want to look at is that the uh, correctional facilities don't believe that there's any sex in the prisons. You know, look at the number of African Americans that you have in the prison system. When they are released, they're released back into the society. And the first thing that what they want to do is have babies. There are all kinds of issues that you're going to look into when you're looking at uh, the issue of incarceration and how it, it impacts on HIV. Also, the fact that we're now promoting uh, something that uh, we all should be concerned about. Everybody is talking about baby daddy and baby mom. You want to have, you know, you want to have kids from five different men and issues like that. So there are issues that we need to address. We need to begin to look at behavior in terms of what we as society promote. You know, so the issue concerning African Americans and HIV, it's something that should involve black leadership on AIDS and HIV. And they're doing it in New York City. So um, we've got to do certain things for ourselves. You know, look at what we're doing and what we're doing culturally and begin to turn around and say what we have to do. Talk about behavior of the of, of the youngsters. You know, begin to talk about the fact that they're not doing anything else. Parents leave them to leave their homes with their uh, pants right on their butts and stuff like that. The girls are almost walking around not wearing anything. You need to begin to look at what's the impact of hip hop on sexual behavior among the young kids and stuff like that. So it's all com you know it's all complicated. We need to begin to look at it as something that we all have to come together and begin to address as a group. And I just want to piggyback off what Dr. A just, uh, what just said very quickly. Uh, I think that it needs to come from an ecological perspective. It's not, you know, we tend to focus on individual behavior, but it needs to be institutional, it needs to be policy, it needs to be, and it needs to match up at all of those levels. 
Just because one thing's happening in a community and it may be great does not mean that it's happening statewide or that it's happening nationally. And there's that disconnect that's causing you know, a rift, I think. Um, and it's, of course, we could say, well, this is what we need to do to fix it, but you know, we now need to do things to actually get to that point. So it's great that, that you're doing that work in the community. Thank you. Uh, Professor Robinson? Oh, did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about what would be an effective online intervention, because the risky behaviors that you're talking about are not happening online. They right, start right. They happen somewhere else. So what would it look like to be sort of more useful in that? Well, based on my data, um, and knowing that we, uh, we found oh, that okay. adventurism and um, HIV optimism were the best predictors of offline risky sex, um, I would say that those would, the, would be the two, if I were developing an intervention, again, I would do this study several more times to you know, make sure that that was the case. I would develop an intervention that obviously uh, addressed those two issues. But I'm not even certain, as you stated, it's just a medium, it's, it's not necessarily, it could be a potential medium for risky behavior. Men may be online and just you know, surfing and checking out the hot photos and masturbating or just chatting or whatnot. I'm not certain uh, and this is a question that should, you know, um, stimulate research in the future, that it's cost effective to even develop sites like My Sexy City or produce videos like the one I've shown. I'm not sure. Um, and there are a lot of agencies out there. This has been like the hot new thing for the past, you know, 10 years or so, really five, six years. Um, GMHC is doing it. Uh, a lot of small nonprofits are just going into chat rooms and having health educators sit in there and answer questions about disease and HIV. Um, again, you, you, know, you have some people who like that, and then you have others who think, think it's intrusive. Uh, so I don't know if it's really a cost-effective way to change a behavior. I'm not sure. There was this, I know this gentleman's been waiting for quite a while. I'm sorry. I'll just ask you, what, what did the, you said that like the Oprah program like no, she, she had the, the uh, what is, it? does anybody know the gentleman's name that, that uh, on the down low that, yes, she had, she had him on and, and she was, you know, this is such a big, uh, you know, new thing and the down low and, again, I love Oprah, but um, men who have sex with men who identify as heterosexual and say they're attracted to members of the opposite sex, this has been around for a while, you know, yes. Professor Schuler, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious about a couple of things. So the data says that people that are prone to more risky or you know, more exotic behaviors can have can engage or and or more optimistic that they're not going to contract HIV or more likely to engage in risky behaviors. So that's right. the primary data. Right. Um, based on your survey bias that you acknowledge, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering uh, about uh, the people that are more likely to take your survey and more likely to be optimistic that, that such surveys are are um, going to be effective. Because people that, you have a survey bias, people that are going to take it in the first place. Mm -hmm. Especially based on your last comment about um, what's going to be effective. How do you study the effectiveness of this? Well, it would, it would have to go beyond, I mean, this is, was a small, uh, you know, underfunded, quick uh, feasibility study. And um, you'd really have to do follow-up studies. You'd actually have to recruit individuals who are online, I would hope to come in and participate in focus groups and, and have them do stuff that was strictly not online. How do you account for that bias? It tends to bias people that are willing to do it in the first place. Those who are willing to fill out the survey? Yeah, it's, that seems to be like the crux of the problem. Yeah, it, it, it's, and I'm not sure how to do that. That's a great question. Um, and, you know, the, all of the, most of the research, uh, if not all of it, that's been done with online samples have that same problem. You know, there is this this selection bias or this, this bias in terms of who's going to fill it out. Same thing with in terms of ethnicity. All studies that have been done with online samples are largely Caucasian men, are largely uh, populated by Caucasian men. So I'm not sure. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, but it, it's, it paints an interesting picture, a preliminary picture. Yes. How are you? Um, I'm great. Everyone here, Dr. Brodsky's class already heard me speak about this, but I read an article in New York Times that did speak about, this was just a follow-up on HIV and black women, and um, they spoke about how Afro African American women have, there's a big stigma with homosexuality among African American men, mm -hmm. so the truth is being hidden a lot of the time, and that 
darkly if that's the reason why there's such an increase in HIV amongst black women because they aren't aware of their, the past history on sexually of mm -hmm. the men they're having sex with mm -hmm. because of stigma. So maybe an acceptance of homosexuality in the black community, community especially amongst women, so that black men would be more honest and, and women would be more aware right. of what they're doing. Right. So it's not just targeting behavior, like don't have unprotected sex. You need to look at, well, why are they having unprotected sex? I trust you. It forms a bond. Um, you know, I want to have babies with you. Uh, you know, what a, yes, Dr. A was talking about that. Um, what are the, what's basically the root of the behavior? And yes, and I think that we need to focus on more holistic approaches to HIV prevention and not just do the condom distribution and not, not just focusing on the behavior but focusing on those knowledge attitudes, you know, policies, things of that nature. Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. quickly, as far as online, um, the surveys, just, I guess to follow up with um, Kyle, are, we, are you promoting offline but for online, like maybe in the clinics and where they're getting tested, promoting the Both. online anonymous surveys so maybe they, they're aware of it offline, but then they go online their own privacy and maybe partake in? Yeah. Right. For this study, I basically promoted it in oh, any way I possibly oh, could. Oh, okay. No, a large portion was sent through emails, but I did create flyers and handed them out okay. and whatnot. Um, I would if I had more time and money and I was a little bit uh, or better well rested. I would ideally just promote online because I specifically want to look at that sample. I don't want men who just go to bars to seek sex, find this and say, oh, I want a Best Buy gift certificate. They fill out and then I get a bunch of you know, surveys with, oh, I only seek sex offline. So I, I really just wanted to look at men who are, you know, are trolling the internet and stumble across this and find that. Um, I think that we have time for maybe one or two more questions and then we'll probably have to wrap it up. Okay. Yeah. So, so, okay, so it says that the, so the whole evidence says that men who deny their behavior uh, well, you, we, can't, we can't assume a causal relationship that, you know, because they're, they're not identifying as gay and they're having, you know, risky sex. Um, but there has been some research to show men who do not identify as gay may engage in riskier sexual behavior. May. It doesn't mean that that is happening all the time. Uh, yeah. And there may, there may, there are probably underlying reasons why they're doing that. Because many of us know, if you wear a condom and you use it properly, it will, th that education is out there. Many people know if you use a condom properly, it's going to be effective. You know, 98, 99 percent of the time. But there's still some reason why we don't do it. And no, what we is don't that? Want to use well, it feels good. It feels good not to use a condom, right? So I mean, that's one issue right there. I mean, I hope you would agree with me, but <laughs> yes. Um, are you, um, men having sex with men are gay, though. Uh, gay is an identity. Gay is gay is an identity. Again, if you don't, if I said I have no gender, I'm not male or female. You would you you would define gay as a man who has sex with another man. If I'm not a man, then I can't be gay. I know it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. Those of you who were in my sex class, we've talked about this before, but. Uh, sexual orientation, identity, not orientation, identity, the way you define yourselves and put yourselves in boxes with or separate from people uh, is socially constructed. There's people who say that they're not a man or a female? So well, no, I'm, 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 oh. well, there are some people who say that, but, um, or who choose not to identify with the, a binary gender. But um, behavior is different than identity because many of us have identified as either heterosexual or bisexual or homosexual before we even started sleeping with somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's just an identity. You can be attracted to men, have sex with women, and call yourself omnisexual. You, you, identity, behavior, and orient and that poses problems and has posed problems in, in research with LGBT populations for quite some time. Yeah, um, I, I think we really have to conclude now, but I think we want to thank Dr. Grosskopf uh, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.